All right. Thank you so much. Um, we'll give everybody, how about one more minute before we get started? Because, Paul, there's been a lot of really good interest in this session. People have been, people want this session so bad. So thank you for taking the time to help us. Very happy. Very happy to. Good. Good. <laughs> Be bad if you hate it. You're like, I can't believe it. I hate, I hate talking about physics. I hate it. <laughs> I do. Uh, let me tell you, I hate talking about physics because it's very hard. I don't do it very well. Um, but okay, I feel like we've got enough of a quorum to go ahead and get started. Um, Paul, for people on the call who might not have heard you, can you start out with a quick introduction to yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Paul, and I've been working at IBM for a little less than two years uh, in marketing. I'm the resident physicist on the marketing team because I dig science communication. Um, and what I was asked to talk about today was uh, like an intro to linear algebra, or the mathematics behind quantum computing. Um, and I geared it for the for you all, for, not for physicists. And um, or mathematicians. So I, I hope this is a, a fun session for you all. So um, <clears throat> the math of quantum mechanics or quantum computing is uh, called linear algebra. Um, uh, but I'm going to start off, like my talk is really going to be more about the essence of it and why is it the math behind quantum computing? What does it have to, what the heck's the connection between linear algebra and, and quantum? And I'm going to start it off by talking about the symmetries of uh, an, an equilateral triangle. It might sound like a weird place to start, but you'll see it makes a lot of sense, hopefully by the end. So um, by symmetry in the sense, what, what I mean is that when you do something to the shape, it looks the same before and after you did that thing to it. Um, and there are only certain things you can do to an equilateral triangle so that it looks the same before and after. Um, I'm going to put, I've put little colors on, at the corners here to show what's being done to the triangle, but talking about it, it as being the same before and after, we have to think of the triangle without those colors. Otherwise, the colors will mess up it being the same. So first, there's, there's a, Mathematicians actually call out one of the things you can do as the do nothing act. Usually marked like this I for identical. It stays the same. It's identically the same before and after you do to it. There are only a few other things you can do to an equilateral triangle that keep it symmetric. There's rotating by a, uh, a third of a full turn counterclockwise, in which case the red's going to move over down here. You see the red's moved over here. And so on. You could rotate counterclockwise by a third, in which case the red moves over this way. You see over here. And then there are three different axes that you can mirror the triangle through. This vertical axis keeps the red the same, but switches or swaps the green and the blue, and so on for the other axes. Yeah. Now, Suppose, let's, let's look at uh, just doing two of those operations, one after the other. First, we'll rotate uh, by a, a third of a full turn counterclockwise so the red moves over down here, see here. Then after that, let's mirror through the vertical axis, keeping the blue still, but swapping the reds and greens here. If we looked back on the previous page here, oops, up, looked back on the previous page, we would see that the end result after doing those two things is like just doing one of those original six operations. It's as if all I did was mirror through this axis here. So a, a mathematician would write this sort of thing <coughs> is to say, if I rotate by a third of a full turn and then mirror along the axis one, it's the same or equal to mirroring, just mirroring through axis two. Right now, this looks a little bit like like multiplication, right? Like x times y equals z, right? But 
what we remember what we what we mean here is really we did this thing then we did this other thing and it happens to be the case mathematicians write the order of things that I did from right to left. So first I did this, then I did this. It's the same as doing this. Okay, so it's not, it's not multiplying in the normal sense, right? And if we looked at a bunch of these, do this, then this, is what ha what's the net result of it? You can create, you'll, you would see a pattern that you could lay out all at once and, and create a so-called multiplication table. Again, it's not really multiplying. So the last relationship we saw, first I do R3, then I do M1, that's equal to M2. Okay, in this table, first I did R3, then I did M1. It's as if all I did was M2, yeah? So that's how you read this sort of multiplication table, right? Now, what, there's a few curious things about this multiplication table. Um, first is, suppose I swap the order of those two operations. Suppose I mirrored, instead of rotating and then mirroring, what if I mirror and then rotate? That's here on the table. Right? First I mirror through the first axis, then I rotate by a third of a full turn counterclockwise. The net result is like mirroring through the third axis, not like mirroring through the second axis, right? So in a normal multiplication table, you, you would expect, for example, two times four equals four times two, shouldn't matter what the order of things is. But in this multiplication table, we see it, order actually matters, right? So that's kind of curious. Another curious thing you'll see, you'll you would notice if you looked at this long enough. Oh, I'm missing a slide. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. All right. So in other words, if we were to write that out, first rotating, then mirroring is not the same as mirroring and then rotating. Okay, this right here is going to be um, the motivation motivational bridge from this sort of math about symmetries to quantum mechanics and quantum computing. We'll get to that eventually. So if we stared at the table a little bit longer, we'd see a few other interesting things about it. First is that for every one of these things you could do to the triangle that keep it symmetric, there's something else you could do next so that the first thing, then the next thing, the net result is like you did nothing the identity operation. So if, for example, I rotate counterclockwise and then I rotate clockwise, it's like I did nothing, right? That's intuitively true. Similarly for mirroring, suppose I mirror through the vertical axis and I mirror through it again, it's like I did nothing, right? What's interesting is that for every single one of these things you can do, they're, it, it, they're guaranteed that there's something else you can do next so that it, it is if you did nothing at all, yeah? There's something else curious about this table if you look at it long enough, which is that you start off with the original six things you could do to the triangle and you do another thing of those original six things next. And that result is one of those six things. Nothing new pops up, right? There's nothing new that pops up. But if I, so, which is weird, think of, think of why that's weird. If this was a multiplication table, there might be, I might have only written it out so far. And then when I do another multiplication, oops, it got bigger, I need to add to the table. Here, <laughs> once you've figured out the six symmetry operations, the table never grows, right? The first thing I mentioned about there's, there's always something that pairs with it to undo it. That is a property that mathematicians call the uh, existence of an, of an inverse, right? For everything you can do to the triangle, you're guaranteed that there's something else that inverts that action and brings you back to doing nothing. The thing of the, meant the property that uh, given the six things you can do to the triangle, nothing new pops up in the multiplication table. Mathematicians call that something special. They call that closure. 
right? In the sense that closure in the sense like the set is, is the set and nothing else is gonna grow out of it. Nothing else is gonna pop up, yeah? And mathematicians have studied systems like this very, very deeply. And it's, it's the mathematics of symmetry. Uh, mathematicians call it group theory for some reason. <laughs> um, and these sorts of properties uh, are true no matter the symmetry you're talking about. Not just for, this is not something special to the equilateral triangle. It's true for squares and circles. It's true for higher dimensional things like spheres uh, and cubes. And if you start thinking abstractly about what it means to have higher dimensional things, this, this stuff is still useful to talk about symmetries in higher dimensional things. Okay, but I won't go there. Okay, so, so far we've been very abstract. We've built this like multiplication table that's not really multiplying, <laughs> right? Um, we haven't really used any numbers yet in the normal sense of a number, right? So, so let's look a little more carefully at those things we're doing to the triangle. And, and let's see if we can see what happens when we start thinking in terms of numbers now. Uh, in the normal sense. So consider the equilateral triangle. I've oriented it a little differently here. In 2D on some uh, co coordinate plane, you have a X axis and a Y axis and a zero here. At, at the intersection of this at these two axes, you've got the zero, zero coordinate. So X, zero, Y. And we're gonna track the vertices here uh, and we're going to say they have some x <laughs> coordinate and some y coordinate, just like a a city has a latitude and a longitude on a map, right? Okay. And I'm going to say this is point one, so its x and y are labeled with a one under it. Point two, point three. Okay. What happens to these? Now, now these are numbers, right? X and y, these are numbers. Suppose that this is one. This, so this is x equals one and y equals zero, let's say, okay. and so on. These think these are normal numbers, right? So what happens to these points when we do those operations, those symmetry operations to, to these points? First, we'll look at this, besides the identity, which is the simplest one, right? It does nothing. The next simplest one to look at with in terms of these coordinate numbers is mirroring across the x-axis. Right, the operation that keeps red still and swaps the green and the blue points with each other. Yeah, mirroring across. Well, let's talk about what happens to the x first. The x coordinates, we see, it's just they're they're the same, right? You draw a straight line down to the x-axis. It intersects those two points and it intersects the x-axis here. So they have the same x coordinate. So we'll say the blue X and the green X are equal to each other. But when we flip them around, we see that the, because the X axis is drawn straight through the middle of the triangle here, we see that the blue and the green Y coordinates are opposites of each other. Again, remember this is the, the zero point, right? So the green point is some negative distance below zero and the blue point some positive distance above zero. That's where this negative sign is coming from, yeah? So I've written it out in terms of an equation between just the X points and a di different equation just in terms of the, the Y coordinates. Now I could rewrite this equation a little bit by saying suppose I want to think a little more generally in the future. Eventually I'm gonna to need to think, I wanna think about the rotation operation too. Well, let me be a little more general here and say, so I'm gonna give myself some wiggle room and say I can relate the, the X coordinate of the blue point to both the X and the Y coordinate of the green point. The rotations might jumble those two coordinates up in some way. So let me rewrite these two equations. I'm just gonna rewrite them as saying, first equation is the blue, <laughs> I 
The first one is blue, x is uh, equal to one times x3 plus zero times y3, right? That's gonna be the same equation as this. And then the second equation I'm gonna rewrite and say zero times x3 minus one times y3, yeah? In the future for other things like the rotation, maybe this number is not zero anymore and this number is not one anymore. So the way a mathematician would look at these two equations and sum them up really quickly and make, make it look cleaner is to say these two coordinates and these two coordinates, and I'm gonna put this box of numbers here that represent exactly this equation. So I take the one, the zero, the zero, and the minus one, and I keep their, their uh, orientations exactly the same, and I just put them in a box, right? We do that because we're thinking about these symmetry operations, right? So we say this point gets moved to some other point by a symmetry operation, in this case, the mirroring, right? So in some sense, this symbol, think of this whole thing, this whole thing in brackets as a symbol. It's that thing is called a matrix. But we're going to just think of it as the symbol, like we were using that symbol M1 before, right? And we'll just say, okay, this point, when I act on it with M1, it gets brought to this other point. What happens in this notation when you mirror twice? If you remember that times table, times table, mirroring twice should be the same as doing nothing at all. So in this notation, we'd say, here's the point. I'm going to mirror it once, and I'm going to mirror it again. Just like before with those abstract symbols, we're going to write from, from right to left. First I did this thing, then I did this thing. Yeah. OK, let's just look at this piece here. And we're going to just carry this piece down, straight down. This piece just goes to the next step. This piece, we saw what happens. x, y gets brought to x minus y. Okay, now we're gonna mirror it again. We know what happens. X gets brought to X and this Y gets negated and a negative of a negative is a positive. Yeah. So where we started is the same as where we ended, just as we intuitively want the mirroring operation to do, right? Well, let's, let's get explicit about the doing nothing the way we were explicit about the doing the mirroring. This is the same as one times x. And what I mean is this x equals one times x plus zero times y. And this y is the same as saying zero times x plus one times y. So let's grab these numbers here, these four numbers in, their, in the way that they're oriented, pull them out, pluck them, and write this new thing here, this matrix where all those numbers are in the same orientation and the X and the Y is brought to look like this, okay? So in our original abstract notation, we, we would say mirroring and then mirroring again along the same axis in both times is the same as doing nothing. And now we have this matrix that represents the mirroring. Mirroring again is the same as doing nothing. Now, <clears throat> these matrices here, multiplying these two matrices is not, it is not the same, it's like multiplying, we're using it metaphorically here, just like before with the symmetries. Do this, then do that. It looks like multiplying, but it's not like two times four because four times two and two times four should be equal, right? So this is not really multiplying, looks like it. Same here. This is not really multiplying matrices. It looks like it. Okay. Turns out that for every one of those things, you symmetry operations you could do to the equilateral triangle, if you do that careful analysis we did with the axes, you, you can find a matrix that does the, the thing to the coordinates that that abstract symbol does in our first drawing, okay? 
you would it is the case that all six of those operations have a matrix like this associated with it. And when you multiply the matrices, you get the same multiplication table between the matrices that you would get with those abstract symbols. So let me go back a few slides to be explicit about that. You would do a one for one substitution. And you say, instead of M1, I'm gonna say that matrix. I'll put that there. Instead of I, I'll put that other matrix there and so on. And I would find that this matrix times this matrix does the same sort of stuff, the same exact pattern, right? Now, so what's interesting is that if you were careful about, uh, let me say it this way, you could find a rule that helps you relate these four numbers to these eight numbers. And you would find a, a calculation rule, sort of like a rule like, like long division has a rule of how to do long division, right? <laughs> you can find a rule that will relate these four numbers in the resulting matrix to the eight numbers in the two matrices that you're multiplying together. But I'm not gonna get into that because it doesn't matter uh, for what we're talking about. Um, but what's, what's interesting is that those rules that relate these numbers to each other, they let you have this relationship like this, where one matrix times another matrix may not be the same as one matrix times that other matrix where all you, well, the only difference is the order in which you're applying them to the system. By applying them, I mean, you know, in the triangle case, doing the thing, right? So the, the math of matrices gives us an interesting sort of relationship that's not possible with normal numbers and normal multiplication, right? Two times four is four times two. And a way a mathematician would say this is to say that normal multi, what's normal to us, normal multiplication with normal numbers is not rich enough to exhibit this interesting behavior. It's not rich enough. So we need a different, we need a different mathematical system to capture this sort of behavior. And matrices, are that system that we've we've settled on matrix multiplication has this sort of richness okay why does that matter because that sort of rich that sort of behavior is what we see in quantum mechanics okay so let me explain uh let me demonstrate that behavior in quantum mechanics so um let me, so it, for, for those of you who've been on the quantum team long enough, you've heard qubit, state, all this stuff, I'm sure up, uh, you're probably familiar with the terms. You've heard them a million times, I'm sure. Um, no. No? No, no, no. familiar, by familiar, I don't mean you get it, just that you've heard them. Ah, uh, okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. I thought you understood. Got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Didn't you Keep read going. the prereqs for this lecture? Huh? Didn't you read the, the list of prerequisites for this lecture? Study quantum. This mechanics. is my first. This is my first day. <laughs> this is your first day of school. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just that you've heard the terms, not that you get it. It's a, so. It turns out that qubits behave. The qubits that we have on our chips are really uh, relatively giant things that you can almost see with the naked eye. Turn, it's just that the math of how they work, it happens to be the case that the math of how they work, that math looks just like the math of how some very, very fundamental phenomena work. Uh, in particular, it, the math looks the same as the physics of a property of electrons, among other things. But I'm, gonna, I'm gonna focus on electrons. 
So electrons have a bunch of ways to specify which, which electron are you talking about, right? Here's a bajillion electrons. Uh, let's talk about that one. Well, how would you, how would you pinpoint, how would you, what, what does it mean to talk about that one and not that one? You could say this one has these X, Y, Z coordinates at this time, and it's going this fast in that direction. I, I've got a snapshot, but I, I know it's, it was going this way this fast, and it's currently there at this time. That helps you identify the electron. But it turns out there's another, you need another number to specify that one and not that one. Even if you specify all of those other things I just talked about, is you need more info to specify, no, 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 that one. And it turns out that, that other thing you need to specify is a, a thing that is, is not describable with, without quantum mechanics. Um, and it turns out that the historical accidents, that thing, that, that other number you need is called the electron spin. Okay, so now if you tell me the XYZ position at a certain time, going at a certain speed in a certain direction, and what is the value of that thing's spin? Okay, now I know you mean this electron and not this other one, okay? So that last property, spin, um, is a purely quantum mechanical thing. And it's, it, it's quantified by uh, two numbers, more or less. Uh, one number talks about, uh, you, let me say it this way, you can specify with a couple of things. One is, it has a sort of directionality to it. You, so, you, so you have to talk about which way is it pointing. The other thing is, once you know the directionality, okay, but is it in that direction or is it in the opposite direction? So there's like directionality, and orientation, okay? Um, and what's weird, this is where the quantum behavior gets very strange. Now I'm gonna start using the illustration, sorry. <laughs> here, this thing here, I've drawn a little can. It's an apparatus to measure spin of electrons, of, elect of an electron inside the can. There's one electron, imagine you have a can, this device, one electron inside of it, and the can has an arrow on the outside of the can. And I press a, when I press a button, there's a little screen on the outside of the can. When I press a button, the can, the device measures the spin of the electron in the direction I'm pointing the can in. So I can orient the can, then press measure. One of the quantum weird parts of, of the spin of an electron is that no matter what direction I point, orient this cannon, when I press measure, only two possible numbers are gonna show up on this screen, plus one or minus one. Nothing in between, just one of those two values, okay? That, that's pretty weird. But let me, now let me talk about things that are not weird about it. One is, if I choose a direction of the can and press measure at time zero, and it happens to give me a plus one, then if I keep the can oriented, if I don't move the can at all, and I press, okay, now what is the spin? Some time later, I press measure again, I'm gonna definitely get plus one again. I press measure again, Definitely plus one again. I could press measure, measure, measure as many times as I want. Every time, after the first time, if I got plus one the first time, and I don't move the can, I'm gonna get plus one every time after that. But if I started by pressing, if I walked away and I came back and things got, you know, people touched the can and stuff like that, I don't know what happened to the can. Then I start over again. And the first time I press, measure, I might get a minus one. But if I get a minus one and I repeat the experiment without moving the can, I will always get a minus one in, per in perpetuity. That's good. That's not quantum. That's classical in the sense that when I look at something, I look at it again, I look at it again, I do 
I would expect to get the same answer, not some random answer each time. Another interesting thing uh, that's not weird. This is not weird at all. <laughs> when if I do that experiment for the first time and I get and I happen to get a plus one, then if I flip the can over 180 degrees, totally flip it over, and I press measure again, I will definitely get a minus one. And if I flip it again and press measure, I'll definitely get a plus one. So this is similar to the, the first thing I said that's, that's normal, right? Which is to say, I looked at it, it was in some state. I looked at it again, it's in the same state. But I see what this is saying is that the orientation of that thing inside the can has a plus and a, and a, a this way or a that way or a character to it, right? And so I can kind of think of it as, in some sense, oh, the spin is oriented along with my can or opposite of the, the arrow on my can, okay? So far, uh, I've only mentioned one weird thing, but these two things are very not, these are normal. Here's another weird thing, okay. Suppose I orient my can in some direction up along the y-axis and I press measure. I could have, at that point, I may have gotten a plus or I may have gotten one. But suppose I got a plus, okay? Next, I now that I got that plus, I'm gonna turn the can along the x-axis and I press measure. I will half the time get a plus and I'll half, the other half of the time get a minus. And you can, and this has been confirmed experimentally by what, what we say is we prepare this, we prepare the plus state. What does that mean? <coughs> when I go to my apparatus for the first time in the morning, I don't know what's going on. I press measure. I might get a plus. If I get a plus good, then I say I've prepared it. Why is that? Why do we use that language? Why do physicists use that language? Because because of this, this behavior. If the first time I get a plus, every time else, I, I definitely get a plus. I've, I, I've put, in a sense, the physicist has put it in that state, and that's definitely there. If I got a minus, okay, let me, let me to make this schematic sensible, where the schematic shows a plus. If I got a minus the first time, I'll just flip the can over. And then I'll then I then the, the schematic looks like this again. Okay. And I'll redo this if uh, if I redo this experiment, which is orient it one way, get a plus. When you have that plus, turn the can 90 degrees, measure it again. Repeat the experiment, repeat the experiment, repeat the experiment many, many times. And what the results of the statistics of that experiment will be this schematic. If it was plus one way and you turn it 90 degrees, you've got a 50-50 shot of getting a plus or a minus. This is weird. This is weird. Question? Yes. So um, in order to get the, once you turn it 90 degrees, if you measure, 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 will you, will it flip between plus and minus or it will stay? Uh, great question. It, after you get, after you press the measure button, if you got a minus and you then you measure again and again and again, you will always get a minus. Just, okay. Yes, exactly. That that's connecting back to this. It's consistent with this. So this is a very good question. Yes. So you have this sort of predictability. If you first get something and you don't touch the can and you keep measuring it, it acts normal. But as soon as you turn it 90 degrees, the only way you can talk about what's going to happen now when I press, if when I press the, the measure button is probabilistically. This is very weird. Now, in this schematic, I have drawn it as up first, then 90 degrees from up. But there's actually nothing special about this up, like Herman just noted, right? Because I can choose any direction and prepare it in the plus state. And then 90 degrees relative to that direction, I get this probabilistic thing again, right? Now, 
so now what a physicist would say is I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to write these things symbolically, just like we wrote our symmetry operations symbolically in the triangle. I'm going to say, if I measure along the Y axis, I'm going to call that by a symbol. It happens to be the, the common symbol is Sigma Y measure the spin in the Y direction. If I measure along the X direction, I'm going to call that Sigma X. So, this schematic is saying, first I measured along y, then I measured along x. Remember, physicists, mathematicians write from right to left. First I measure along y, then I measure along x. This picture here is saying, first I measure along x, then I measure along y. Okay. Well, because of this weird probabilistic nature, Oh, that only appears when I turn the can away from the first measurement. It is the, the results of those statistics experiments is that the order matters. The order in which I measured things gives me different answers. Or in other words, sigma x, then measure x, then measure y is not the same as measure y, then measure x. This is weird. This is extremely weird. Why? Think of measuring a table, the top of a table. Suppose you had a, a tape ruler and you measure the width and then you measure the depth and then you get an area, width times the depth. That's the area of my tabletop. First I measure the width, then I measure the, the depth. I get an area. Now let's switch the order. Um, first I'll measure the depth, then I'll measure the width. I'm going to get the same answer, right, for the area of the tabletop. Nothing like this happens except in quantum mechanics. Nothing like this. And so early physicists and mathematicians looking at quantum phenomena, when they were looking for a math structure, what kind of math should we use? Then they saw this. And they, you could rule out the regular numbers and regular multiplication, but there was this obscure branch of math at the time, early 1900s, very obscure. Nobody except math majors learned it in school called matrix or linear algebra. And thankfully, a couple of a mathematician and a physicist were talking to each other one day. And the physicist said, what the hell is this kind of math? I never heard of it before. Oh, it does this? That's interesting. And so quantum mechanics was originally called matrix mechanics because matrix, the math of matrices captures this sort of weird times table, times table, do this, then that, measure this, th measure this way, then measure that way, written like a times table where the order of the t multiplication matters. And that's it. That's my lecture. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, the, uh, so linear refers to the fact that order of operations matters. Is that what the word linear means here? Um, not exactly. Um, linear means um, if I look at two different systems and I do one thing to one system and I do another thing to another system. And then I want to do a, a third thing to both systems. Uh, uh, I'll talk to you offline. <laughs> okay, thank it's you. It's complicated actually to answer that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, Abby. It was, it was just gonna be a semantics question, of that, but uh, yeah. No, it's not, so, no, it's a good question. But it'll take me some time to answer it. Thank Abby, you. Really, sorry. I also wanted to know why, if there's a reason why they go right to left. Why is that? My my wife gave me a, I don't know if this is true, but she thought, well, maybe the, maybe the Arabs did, did the research in this math first. Mm. You know, Interesting. I think it's plausible. Huh. And where is that? <laughs> I don't know the, I don't know the true answer though. <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying that they 
is the math of quantum mechanics is this way because <laughs> linear algebra is this way no, no, or are no. they like simultaneously <laughs> i mean not simultaneously <laughs> like obviously the math was around first but then yeah. everything just happened to work out the same well um that's a deep philosophical question. <laughs> <laughs> right is 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 math the universe <laughs> well um einstein out? would or say yes abstract? no <laughs> galileo right mathematics is the language with which god has written the universe right. um so but that's so, like super mind-blowing yeah it's very weird and there was uh like i said there was the these sorts of accidental meetings with the minds where this math was was formalized hundreds of like one or two hundred years before physicists started seeing weird stuff in their experiments. And you said this was, was like in the early two thousands. No, uh, early nineteen hundreds. That they just started defining quantum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and this math happened to be waiting around for them, all figured out by mathematicians already. Yeah, we, we actually use this math in engineering for, um, I said it earlier on in the chat, transformation. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, when we want to when we want to move an object in space, we we describe it by those matrices, and right. the Just way like we actually, time, right? yeah, and the way we actually the way we actually do the multiplication, it. It actually works out like the, the way it's written and the way you do the calculation. It actually works out that you have to do it from right to left to get the right answer. <laughs> so the answer kind of makes sense on the other other side. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. And then the, the linear part, I think the linear part just comes from the fact that they're all. Uh, well, the, well, Herman, the, you got to know your audience. I don't want to get into Oh, that. sorry. <laughs> Sorry, my that. bad. You're okay. You're a plant. I don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> no, I just I just joined the team three weeks ago. All right. What I mean is you, you're a very technical. <laughs> you're a very technical person. I wanted this for for people who haven't taken oh. the math classes. May I ask one more question? Um, I keep hearing that one of the amazing things about quantum computing, quantum mechanics, is the reversibility. Um, but I'm and for a while, I was like, well, why can't, for a while, meaning like for the last 45 minutes, I was like, well, but these matrices, you can't, um, the order matters, but I guess, but like order does, but, but I guess the order mattering isn't the same thing as being irreversible. Great question. That's such a good question. Love it. Um, so what Abby's talking about is, you know, if I, if I shatter my glass, I'm probably not going to see the process in reverse anytime soon. But things like little things that happen at the quantum scale happen forwards and backwards all the time. So, um, and, and, and Abby, you kind of already answered your own question, I think, which is to say the order of these things you're doing to the triangle, the order of in which you do them matters. But the, in, at the quantum scale, there's nothing stopping the the quantum triangle from being mirrored this way or that way. No big deal. Okay. Can go this way or this way. But if I mirror this way and then I rotate that way, the order of operations matters. But any one of those operations could be carried out in the opposite way. Like here's rotate this way or rotate the opposite way. Right. But why isn't a Q sphere a block sphere? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Abby. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Gonna get kicked was, out, Abby. Any other cheap, questions? cheap shots. It was good. Do we do we have time for one more? Can I ask one? Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Just making sure. Um, I often feel like I hear that one of the defining characteristics of quantum mechanics is that it's probabilistic, and so I, what I'm seeing in linear algebra does. I, maybe I'm totally wrong. Like, how do you connect the whole probabilistic part to the linear algebra part? Like, are they the same thing, or are they separate things? Does that no, question even make sense? sense? No, that question makes a lot of sense, actually. OK. It's another deep one. Um, so one, 
the way I would probably go about that is um, there are different like frameworks and philosophies of quantum mechanics where you know you want to start from ground zero. Well, different physicists pick a different ground zero to build the theory and, and the understanding of it from as a starting point. And um, some people start here actually, which doesn't seem to say anything about probability. It's just do this, then this is not the same as do that, then this, right? Um, the folks who start here uh, call this thing uh, complementarity between the things you're doing. In this case, measure along X and, and measure along Y. And um, some people who, who start here very quickly, starting from here, get to the so-called Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And saying that this thing that the saying order matters is the same thing as saying the uncertainty principle, which then you go in and then once you're there, then you can start talking about probabilities. Some people start that way. Other people start at the probability side first. And what they say is that um, in, the, in this example here, we're talking about, we were tracking how points move around here. And what people who, and we're moving them around with matrices and we're, the points themselves are what these things here are what are called vectors. This is a vector that represents a, a point. And this is a matrix that changes the vector from one vector into a new vector. But folks who start with the probability side of things, they'll say that describing um, the state of, a, of an electron spin is like thinking of coordinates, points in, in a coordinate space. But here, X and Y, like latitude and longitude, are what are called real numbers. It just means that they multiply in a certain way. They have a certain multiplication table. But those probability folks will say, Imagine these points were not just describable by real numbers, but you also had to specify imaginary numbers too. And now we've got vectors that have coordinates that are complex numbers with the real and imaginary part. And we've got to move those around. How do we move those things around? And what they, what they end up, uh, what they ended up developing was this probability theory of quantum mechanics where the coordinates rep are, are, represent, are, are, in, are telling you something about pro the probability of finding it in this point. I'm waving my hands a lot. I don't know if you can tell. But Probably when you start with, it's harder, in my opinion, it's harder to start with the probability. It's, it starts feeling really, really weird and, and arbitrary to me. I don't like it. Uh, I'd much prefer the, the, the way I explained it. <laughs> Just, hey, this is weird. When I measure a table this way or this way and then this way, like I get the same, but when I'm studying quantum things, that's not true anymore. What the hell's going on? And, and What's crazy is that you can get to the probability theory starting here first. So I like it. I prefer it. I prefer starting here. Hey, hey Paul, did, did, did I hear you right when you said the imaginary component would determine the probability Not just of the, the real component? No, no. It's just, it's just that the probabilities have to do with the complex coordinate, the full complex coordinate, both the, the Oh, there's a direct relationship. What's yeah. the, okay. Yeah. okay. Pretty weird stuff. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Why is the state destroyed when it's measured? Mm, okay. Uh, well, yeah, think of it this way. The experiments show this weird sort of randomness, but predictable randomness. That is to say, you turn the can 90 degrees, the statistics will tell you that it's 50-50. And it's reliably 50-50. Right? So it's random, but but uh, not chaotic. Yeah. So um, 
when you say you're going to actually carry out the measurement, <clears throat> before the measurement, I don't know, maybe you can talk about that. I don't know. <laughs> I got slack something there. But <laughs> uh, before you measure up and before you press the measure button, you can only describe what you think is going to happen with probabilities. But once you press the measure button, you're not uncertain anymore at all. You know exactly, you, you press the button, you know what it is, right? And it's really just that. It, com it comes down to that is after you measure it, there's, you're not uncertain anymore. So the probabilistic description is not useful anymore because it's 100% likely that the thing you just did happened, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, Paul, yeah. we're a little bit over. We're going to go ahead and uh, get done here in a second. Um, all I really have to say is thank you. And what's our next lesson going to be? Because this was super helpful. I think everybody's going to need to sit with it for a while. At least I'm going to need to sit with it for a while. Um, but when I sit with it for a while, I know I'm going to be hungry for more. And so, um, would you be willing to help us out with a, a continued session about this in the future? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Yay. That's great. We'll get you in the calendar. We've got a couple things coming up, so we'll take a math break, but then we'll come back to you um, in hopefully not too long, Paul. Sounds good. Thank you. This is Thanks, fantastic. Paul. Thank you.